ready to worship this morning? We're going to talk in a little bit exactly what that means to worship. But we are going to worship through music here in just a minute. So if you will stand with me, we are going to uh, we are going to have our prayer of con consecration this morning. I'll start us out and then ask you the guys to kind of pray with us together corporately. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Jesus, I belong to you. I lift up my heart to you. I set my mind on you. I fix my eyes on you. I offer my body to you as a living sacrifice. Jesus, we belong to you. Let us pray as we get ready to go into worship this morning. I will take you guys real quickly uh, that we are having revival services over at New Beginnings this week. Uh, we'll be starting the revival this morning after I leave here. Uh, and so uh, I will be leaving towards the end of the service, and Stephen will be leaving the rest of the service. And so I just want to think that I'm not hanging around to visit with anybody, but I do need to get over there. Uh, after the sermon this morning, but uh, we do have administrative council meeting today at 2. <clears throat> I'll be back for that. Anybody needs me anytime, my phone number is on the full, uh, front of the bulletin. I would love to talk with you, meet with you, uh, and serve your family any way that I can. Um, and I also encourage you to come out with us uh, to revival. I've got some information I think I've put in the church's uh, Facebook. We've got some wonderful speakers. We've got um, Chris McDaniels, who used to be a part of the band uh, Confederate Railroad, who is now a Christian revival speaker. Uh, he's coming out on Monday night. Our presiding elder here in Southern Methodist Church, uh, Tom Newman, is speaking tonight. Tuesday, uh, my former pastor from Georgia, one of the best preachers I've ever heard in my entire life, Bishop Lance Johnson, will be coming to preach. And then Wednesday night, Paul Cecil, some of you guys might know him from Emmaus, We'll be preaching, and we would love for you guys to come out and be a part of that. So let's get together, and let's pray together as a church. Can we do that? Yeah. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we invite your Holy Spirit, God, to come and speak to our hearts this morning. God, help us to decrease and for you to increase, God. Many of us have come in, God, with an idea of what church should be or shouldn't be or, or how we need to do things or how we need to, God, and Lord, we just want to kind of move all that stuff out of the way and say, come, have your way, God. Have your way this morning. Speak to our hearts. Move in our lives, God. Change our families, Lord. Unite us. Move us together for your mission. Let us experience the true joy that you have for us in your kingdom, God. And now let us pray in the way that our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Please remain staying for uh, our call to worship. And also, uh, as we invite the light of Christ to come in uh, with our acolyte this morning.
like a light for the whole world, a city built on top of a hill cannot be hidden, and no one would light a lamp and put it under a clay pot. A lamp is placed on a lampstand where it can give light to everyone in the house. Make your light shine so that others will see the good that you do will that you do and will praise your Father in heaven. Uh, I probably wonder why I have this hat. <laughs> and in my pocket I have a small but very tight flashlight. It's a pretty bright light. If I put it under this hat, no one can see it. If we don't show, show the love for our uh, for Christ that's in our heart to others, we're like this lamp under the hat. No one can see it. So how are some of the ways that you can show the love that you have in your heart to Christ? When at home and your mom and dad ask you to help you clear the uh, table after dinner, that's one way of showing Christ's love. Uh, if you're at school and on the playground with your classmates, uh, or in the gym, getting along with them is another way that you can show that you have the love of Christ in your heart. What are some other ways that you can show the world that you have Christ in your heart? You got some other ways? One of the ways you're doing it this morning is up here, sharing in the children's ministry. Coming to church regularly on Sunday is another way to show that you have Christ in your heart. So the way you live, uh, can see, the others can see Christ in you if you do unto others and you find them do unto you. Let us pray together. Repeat that to me. Dear Lord, let us to remember to let our light shine so others can see Jesus in us. Amen. Church will be following Stephen. Uh, it's listen. like the pie type, the kids eating the kids. Pie type or anything come out. We'll let you guys know that we also have the nursery open. Uh, zero to one has Kate Holman in there, and um, age two to three, Jill Rimmer is there. So we should have nursery open every Sunday. So if you've got friends that are coming with babies or little ones, and uh, just let you know that we've been working on that. And uh, I would love for parents to be able to come and, uh, and for us to be able to minister to them in that way. If you are visiting with us this morning, I will say, <clears throat> ask you to, uh, I meant to mention this earlier, uh, there is a, a little flap on your bulletin. If you'll fill that out, uh, you can just bring that forward after or give it to one of our staff members this morning. Uh, we would love uh, to be able to get to know you more. There's also on the back for prayer requests. If you are wanting prayers added to the prayer list, there needs to go on that. So me and uh, Sandra, our secretary, was talking through this this morning. This is our best way to be able to know and remember and make sure that things are written down. Uh, if you need something added to the prayer list, please, please add it to this um, as well. So, are you ready for the word this morning? Yes. Awesome. I feel like I'm forgetting the days of the notes, but that's all right. We're going to start with the message. So in 1960, and some of you guys might be football historians. Forgive me if I mess this up. The only sport that exists to me is professional wrestling. <laughs> so can <laughs> I get a woo? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Church boy. God knew what he was doing he wrong here, right? Um, <clears throat> Man, that threw me off about women crying. No. Uh, 1960, the NFL championship in between Green Bay Packers and, um, and the Philadelphia Eagles. And the Packers had one of the best coaches ever, had some of the best players. His name was Vince Lombardi. Anybody remember him? Remember Vince? Yeah, so, uh, but they lost. They lost the championship by just a, just a little bit. So the next season, the 1961 season, Vince goes to start their, their training their training to get ready for the upcoming season. And he says, we can't do that again. We can't experience 
that type again. So he thinks through hard what he needs to do. And as the men are coming in, these are men that have been playing football since they were little boys. They played the little, you guys any, remember Pee Wee Leagues? Do you remember that? Pee Wee Leagues? They always run the wrong way and stuff. Yeah. So these guys have been playing their entire life. They've been playing street ball. They've been playing, they played for the middle schools, high school. I don't know if they had middle schools back then, but high schools. They've been playing and they've been around football. They ain't going to tell how many times that they've touched a the football. Passed it, caught it, tackled all the things for football, and they knew it to the point that they had rose to the top of being the best of the best of the best and playing for the Green Bay Packers in the National Football League. And Vince Lombardi, one of the best coaches, finally come up with his best course of action, how to start practice. And he sits all the players down, professionals, mind you, and he brings it out. And he says, gentlemen, this is a football. Gentlemen, this is a football. It's shaped like this, and it's done this. And he gets them to open up a basic, fundamental book on how you throw a football, how to catch a football, how the football plays. And he takes these professionals through the essentials of what the game of football actually is. Now, some of y'all, younger folks, when I say football, you're thinking soccer. The devil's a liar. Okay? <laughs> we ain't talking about that man. We're talking about this right here. Okay? <laughs> this is a football. The very, very, very basics. And I can't help but think this morning, uh, as I've grown up in the church, and uh, I have served in the church, now in pastoral ministry, youth pastor ministry. I've met all kinds of people from all kinds of uh, walks. Less than a year ago, we started a church out of a group of people that had, one had grown up in a UMC church her whole life. She'd never been baptized. 73 years old. And she made a profession of faith faith, trust in Jesus. And I lowered her into the waters of baptism. There's people of all ages that have grown up in the church and been a part of the church that simply don't know the basics of the Bible. They caught up some things. They're, at best, armchair quarterbacks. You know what that is? That's people like me who don't watch the Super Bowl. You, know, you might catch a game here or there and you act like you know what you're talking about a little bit. But you really don't. How many people in the church do you think are more armchair quarterbacks and they really don't know the fundamentals of the faith? They really don't know the fundamentals of the Bible. What the Bible teaches, what Jesus expects of us, and how are we to be disciples? So I want you to think about this for a second. Imagine if it was any other uh, craft or anything. Imagine that you like showed up to work one day and uh, you said, I'm going to be a bricklayer and you're going to go lay some bricks and they're going to, hey, we're going to put you with Jerome over here. And Jerome has been working here for 25 years. He'll be retiring soon and everything like that. And he's going to show you everything you need to know about bricklaying. And they put you over there with little Jerome and you're all excited. You're ready to put some bricks down and some mud or whatever they do, level it out. Oh, I don't know. And Jerome says, I honestly don't know, man. I don't know how to do that. And I'm here to say this morning, not to step on toes, not to make people feel bad, but just reveal some truth this morning that we have churches all across America, if not the world, that are full of people that have been sitting in chairs, that have been going to Sunday school classes, discipleship, missions trips, and stuff like that, and they don't even know Jesus, or they barely know the faith. And if, if, and if that's you this morning, like I said, this is not to condemn at all, but it's to like shed light on a situation to say, hey, what if we were to really 
live and believe the things that Jesus taught us? What if we were to like really, really, really just open the Bible and say, okay, this is where we're at. This is our starting point. Let's be honest about it. Yeah, I've been in church my whole life. Or, yeah, I went to Sunday school. I went to VBS. I did all these things. Or maybe I made a profession of faith, but I really don't know who Jesus is and, and, and all that stuff. And, and we were just saying, okay, this is, this is for real. We're going to quit faking. We're going to quit doing all this stuff. And we're going to open our Bibles. And we're going to find out what Jesus really meant. We're going to find out what he meant by worship, by the church, by what it means to be a Christian. Because all of us growing up in the South have heard what it's supposed to be like to be a Christian, right? You've heard me say it before. Don't smoke, drink, or chew, or date girls that do. <laughs> Don't do the bad sins, but it's okay to do the other ones that's acceptable. Stephen asked me, that was a weighted football over there. He said, did you not play him hit anybody in the face with it? Well, not unless they needed it. So I would not sleep if I was you this morning. <clears throat> so if we were to just come together this morning and we were to drop all the tradition and drop all the ritual and drop all just everything, our history, and we're just to say, just open the Bible and say, what is it? What is worship? What is church? What is Sunday school and why do we do it? What is baptism? And revisit a lot of those basic fundamentals just to see if we lost something. I remember years ago hearing a story about a woman in the church who, um, who her daughter uh, was was watching her said, hey, I'm going to learn how to cook the Easter ham. And, and the mom said, well, you, you got to go in here, you got to get the ham, and you got to cut the ends off the sides of it, and, and, and then we put it in the oven. She goes, well, why do we put it, cut the sides off of it? And, and she goes, I don't know, my, my, my grandma always, or my mom always does that. And she said, well, let's find out. And so they called her, and they said, why did you always cut the ends off that? And she said, well, I really don't know, but we just always did that. My mama did. Sure enough, her mom was still alive. And they called her and they said, Hey, we got four generations here of people cutting the ends off this ham. Why do we do that? And she goes, You silly girls. She goes, My pan was too short for that size ham. <laughs> truth in that story, which may or may not be true, but how many things do we do in church, and or even in our Christian walk, that we've picked up that's maybe unbiblical or extra-biblical, or we've considered it to be one of those grave things that you don't undo or do or something like that, and it's just something that we've picked up from other people. It's not something that our Savior is actually requiring of wouldn't you hate to know, like, go to heaven, and God saying, I'm glad you're here, but man, did you miss out on a lot. Man, did you miss out on a lot. I have my power that I gave to you through the church. I gave you kids. I gave you grandkids. I gave you all these things, and you missed out. Following the people around you, and not Jesus. You ever seen a death spiral from ants before? Anybody, any biology majors? Anybody seen that? I say that to make me look smart, but <laughs> I don't even know what a biology is, really. <laughs> okay, so ants don't have brains like we have. Just in case you didn't know that, I found that out on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> They don't have decision-making brains. Put it that way. They don't have decision-making brains. When you see ants in a line, they're simply following the pheromones of the ant in front of them. And somewhere along the way, an ant will get on the wrong tracks, leave the pheromones, and they'll get stuck in a circle. 
sometimes you can see hundreds, thousands, maybe even ten thousands of ants. Look it up sometime. It's called a death spiral. And the ants just keep working, running that circle until they die. They never, and you'll start seeing them die off, and there'll be bodies of little ants laying, laying everywhere. <laughs> out there, never fulfilling their purpose in life, to gather food, to serve their queen, to do whatever it is that ants do. I don't know. It's not about that lot. But dropping dead, not doing what it is that they were created to do, simply because they were following the people around them. So we're going to look at this story. We're, going to, uh, we're starting a series called The Heart of Worship. We sung the song, and I'll be talking about that here in just a second. But we're going to get into some uh, a couple of other things. I gave you a little intro right there, but we're going to be talking about the woman at the well. And it's really hard for me to talk about this story and not preach the whole message. I'm going to do my best to really just focus in on two scriptures here out of the story. But to give you a little little background. Jesus and his disciples are traveling. His disciples go into, they're like near Samaria, which Samarians are like half Jews and half Gentiles. Uh, they believe they're worshiping on this mountain instead of worshiping in the temple in Jerusalem and all that stuff. And so Jesus has this encounter with this woman. It's a really great story. Read it sometime, John chapter 4. But he reveals something in there that I want to talk to about this morning without getting into the other details of that story. But he prophetically tells this woman who she is and what she's up to. He says, go fetch your husband. She says, I don't have one. He says, you're right. You've had five husbands. The guy you're with now is not your husband. you got to check in and all that stuff. And she says, you must be a prophet, and he says, you know, the Messiah, you know, that kind of thing. And, and then she goes right into this question, not how did you know that, or uh, how many fingers I got behind my back, or any of that, okay? She's not asking any of those things. She goes right to the subject of worship because she is a Samaritan. Number one, men really didn't talk to women out in public like that that they were not related to or married to or trying to get married to. And, um, and uh, Jews didn't talk to Samaritans. They were, I mean, there was just like this very ethnic, racial divide in between them. But Jesus broke all those barriers and he talked to her. And she's asking all these questions. Why did, uh, you know, why are you a Jew talking to me, a man talking to a woman, all that stuff and, and everything. And so... She gets right to this question. You know, like, as soon as she finds out that like, he's the Messiah or he's a prophet, that there's somebody that can finally introduce some truth into her life. She's been looking for it, obviously, in these men, which obviously she ain't that good at picking out. Just saying. And she keeps hopping from one man to one man to one man, and looking. Now she's with another guy. She's so this is at least the sixth guy that she's with, and she comes to the center. Um, but she finally comes to someone that knows some truth, that can get her out of this death spiral, right? And she wants to know, did you say that you need to worship, this correct worship at the temple in Jerusalem, but we say you got to worship over here at Mount Gerizim, which is it? And Jesus says this, he said that salvation comes through the Jews, you know, that they got it right. He's not afraid to, to like, tell the truth, which we never need to be afraid to tell the truth. But he says this in John chapter 4, verse 23. But the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Notice he didn't say in ritual. Notice that he didn't say that it was going to be by keeping a few select rules. But he said they're going to worship in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. Our Savior
Savior, the very person of truth in this world, tells us, reveals to us the will of the Father that God is looking for people like you and me, but he's looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. People that will be allow themselves to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to follow his will. People that will be willing to live by the truth and say, I'm not just going to pick up grandma's religion. I'm not just going to go pick up what the family has fed me down. I'm not just going to go pick up what culture has told me. I'm going to open the truth and I'm going to read the truth and find out what the truth is. And that is going to be the guardrails for my life, but it's also going to be the guardrails for my worship. Years ago, my uncle was a Quaker minister. He was kind of a high up in the Quaker denomination or whatever they are. And, and he calls me one day and he says, how on earth have y'all been able to, because they were one of the very first mainline denominations that just really went off the wayside. Because they wanted to focus more on the love of this, love of that, love of that, and just let all people in and, 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 and do all that stuff, but not have any guard rules for truth. And I told him, I said, man, it starts with biblical authority. It starts with biblical authority. It starts there. If you hold to the Bible as the teaching of the Word of God, just like Jesus told us in 2819 in the Great Commission, Go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them everything that I've taught you, right? That's where denominations go off. That's where churches go off. It's when they substitute the word of God for a lie. Jesus said that God is looking. He says, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I want you to listen to this. There was a 2005 study that was actually come out in a book called Soul Searching. And it was written by a guy named Christian Smith, who was a researcher at our very own United, or University of North Carolina chapter. And he wanted to study Christianity in our culture. And he wasn't studying it from a Christian perspective, but he wanted to study uh, Christians as a people group. And what he did is, what he came up with was that Christian teenagers, okay, mind you, this is a 2005 study that had covered previous years before that, probably well over 20 years of data, which means that some of y'all would have fell into the generation that he was studying. And he come up with this term that what Christians really believe, what cultural Christians really believe, and he called it moralistic, therapeutic deism. I'm going to say that again. That sounds like a bunch of big words, but think about it for a second. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. There were some morality beliefs in there that made you feel better. And it was kind of aimed at a God. The five things that he found in common, number one, was that they believed that a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. That's not bad. We believe that, don't we? Number two, that God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Mm, that sounds a little vague. Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about one's self. Now it's meddling, right? Because if we were to sit there and think through our life, that's pretty much what a lot of us, I even find myself at times, worried about how can I live the happiness. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Does the Bible teach that? Do 
Do songs on Caleb teach that? Seriously, do, are, are there Bible studies, are there books, are there songs, are there things that would promote this idea in cultural Christianity? Yes, there is. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. How many of you guys know people who don't show up to church except when it hits the fan, right? Some of y'all wound up in church because something hit the fan, right? God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Number five, God, good, I'm sorry, good people go to heaven when they die. Good people go to heaven when they die. What's the Bible say? It says there is none good, right? There is none good. We have all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. If we die in our sins unrepentant without receiving the salvation of Jesus Christ, you indeed will go to the same hell that Hitler did. You indeed will go to the same hell that any murderer or rapist or anything did because a violation of God's law is a violation of God's law. So there's been this religion, this, this subset of what should have been biblical Christianity in our culture that has been turned into this moralistic, therapeutic deism. I'm going to cover these again real quick. A God exists who created and ordered the world and watched over human life on earth. Well, that's, that's kind of good. God wants us to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem and good people go to heaven when they die. Nothing about the lordship of Jesus Christ, nothing about repentance, nothing about core tenets of what the Bible teaches about what Christianity is. And this, my friends, is what is taught, not necessarily in a Sunday school book, not necessarily sometimes from the pulpit, but this is what's taught by Christian lifestyles in our country. Psychologists say that more is caught than taught when raising your kids. And most in our generation, if not the generation before, the generation after us, live by these principles. And not by the Word of God. Do you, want to, do you want to worship the real God? Do you want to worship the real God? I'm going to tell you where God shows up. God shows up where he's wanted. And if we want to be a church that experiences the presence of God, to be able to see the miracles that God has in store for us, to be able to see families redeemed, marriages restored, to be able to see the sick healed, to be able to see people, sinners repent, and for us to be able to see God do something amazing, then we have got to go after the real God. Amen. And we have got to lay down our understanding of what Christianity is and pick up this. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a Bible. This is a Bible. And we need to look at some basics. We need to look at some things. Patrick Morley wrote a book, a men's ministry book called Man in the Mirror, and he said, there is a God we want, and there is a God who is. And they are not the same God. The turning point of our lives, and I would say the turning point of our church, is be when we stop seeking the God we want, we start seeking the God who is. When we stop seeking the God we want, and start seeking the God who is. If we find ourselves not worshiping God in spirit and truth, then how do we change? How do we do that? Do we not watch as much Netflix? Do we give a little bit more an offer and play? What do we do? How do we do that? Well, let's look. There is a such thing called the law of first understanding. You guys, any college majors in here? You've heard that before? The law of first understanding. Does anybody want to take a stab? Real quick. 
about when worship was first used in the Bible. We just covered it back here in our altar. It was in Genesis 22. Genesis 22, 5. If you want to mark that or if you want to open that up. God had picked Abraham to be a father to his people. The first time that this word worship is ever used in this is when God has called Abraham to give up his only son. Not his only son, but his only son of the promise. To give up Isaac. And Abraham takes his son, says, yes, Lord. And in 22.5, he says, he gives the servants the instructions, stay here with the donkey. Abraham told the servants, the boy and I will travel a little farther and we will worship there and we'll come right back. It's the first time the word worship is used in the Bible. <coughs> the word worship is actually two words that have been combined together in the English language and we use it as worship. And it means this, worth-ship. Worth-ship. What is God worth? What is God worth? And when we are giving worship, it has nothing to do with music. You can worship while music is going. But worship is a lifestyle. Worship is how you live. When we come together to worship, it is telling God how much He is worth. And can I ask you this morning, church, is it good? Yeah. Is He amazing? Is He all powerful? And is He worth all the glory and all the praise and everything that we can give Him? Absolutely He is. The first use was giving God what he was worthy of receiving. And that's everything. Abraham had been waiting his entire life for this son. He had been prophesied. He had received messages from angels. Quite possibly Jesus in the flesh. And, and now Abraham was going to give up everything. So if we say God is worth everything, is he worth your time? Do we make time to worship God? Not just at church, but at home. In the car. God, you're good. Thank you so much, God, for this day. God, you're great. You've given me a great family. You've given me, you've provided, you've given me this job. God, I don't know much about you right now at this point in my life. But I know what your word says. And it says that there's angels that are surrounding you. That they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. <coughs> Is God worth our time? As a youth pastor and as a family pastor, I've worked long enough and... Never thought I would see today. You know how, like, when you're like in your 20s, you think everybody's like way older than you and you'll never get there? Well, that's a lie. Um, <laughs> kids that I've had in student ministry now, many of them are in their 30s. They've had kids, or they're uh, married, and I've got kids, former students in every, every stage, still some in college. And unfortunately, I've seen and I've went and visited some students in jail. I've seen some students that have made wrecks of their lives. And their parents will make statements like this. We raised them in church. Where did we go wrong? We raised them in church. You might have been a part of the church. And this is going to get real. If you get mad at me, I'm sorry. I'll be available. I'll be over here Monday. You can come yell at me. You can me in the office. That's fine. Bring me a coffee if you don't mind. And there's a lot of us that believe that we're raising our kids in church. But remember what I said about more being caught than taught? There's some of us that at the first inkling of anything else that comes along better, we're willing to skip church for it. We're willing to skip church. We're willing to skip worship. got to go to the 
beach, we're going to skip worship. Now, I'm not saying you can't go to the beach, but make worship part of it. Somehow, watch us online or go to a church or something. Our kids can't be involved in summer camp because we got ball. Because we got this and we got that and we can't, we can't do this. And, and people believe that they're raising their kids in church because they come here twice a month. And they bring their kids here, but, but what they're really teaching them by what is being caught by them is that when anything else better comes along, and there's a whole lot of better out there, we're going to pass up on the church. We're going to pass up on giving and give in our own way. But listen, let's answer the question real quick. If we believe that God's good and he's worth everything, is he worth our time? Is he worth our money? Is he worth our career? Is he worth our status? A lot of us are so worried about what our families think about us because we started coming to church or we started serving in church. My family, my in-laws, everybody was completely satisfied when I worked a job and, and we went to church on Sundays, every other Sunday because I worked every other weekend. Nobody said a word. That was completely acceptable. But the moment that God called me into the ministry and we said we're moving out of our hometown to go to Bible college, you would have think, thought that we had killed a puppy right in front of somebody. You would think it was the worst thing. People could not believe it. Friends, in-laws, are y'all crazy? Have you lost your mind? Are you joining a cult? All that stuff? No, we, we get what you're saying, preacher. We get what you're saying. No, 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 no. Let's go back to the parents. Let's go back to the parents for a second. Do you know how many parents I've sat down and talked to? Their kids have told me that they've been called to ministry and they wanted to go to a Christian college and their parents said, no way. They need to go to a state school and get a good job. They might not have used those exact words, but they used that. And I want you to tell you what that really is. And, and there is a common place for Christian students to go to state school. They, I'm going to say that up front. But I'm also going to say this, that there are Christian parents that will take priority, believe priority of those state schools that are, are, that are godless and that demons are working in. Yeah. Specifically, to turn your kids away from the faith. And then you want to call me up later and say, we did everything we could. We raised them in church. No, you prioritized a cultural living over the truth of God's word. Whether we're going to believe this or we're not. Whether we're going to, whether we're going to say that this is true, the word of God, and we're going to live by it, and we're going to... We're going to run our families by it. We're going to run this church by it. We're going to, everything that we do in the power of the Holy Spirit and, and everything that we do, whether we're going to use this or we're just going to keep on using whatever that feels good. Career, your status, your life, your service to the church. Do you know how many positions, volunteer positions that we have right now that we need people to serve in this church? We had almost 215 people here on Easter Sunday. And guys, we've got to get this kids ministry restructured. And it's going to take some people that's willing to serve. Are you willing to give your kids, if your kid says, you know, I've, I've changed my mind or God's calling me to ministry. Yes, yeah, is there a discernment? Yeah, absolutely there's discernment. Is there a process and a discernment period? Yes, absolutely. But if your child comes up and says, I want to be a missionary, are you going to be okay with that? Are you really going to be okay with that? Can I take that to an extreme for a second? Are you all okay? I know four parents have been okay with their kids coming out as a member of the LGBTQ community than I have ever seen them be okay 
with their kids coming out to be a radical Christian with you. They'll say, well, we don't agree with it, but we love our kids. They don't argue with them. They don't do any, any of that. And there's a whole process. There's a whole way to deal with that situation. A better way to deal with that. So I'm not, not saying something I'm not. Okay? But there are Christian parents out there that would balk at the idea of their kids serving our King Jesus for the rest of their lives in another country. Corey Ten Boom, who wrote the book Hiding Place, she was a, a Jew in a concentration camp who came to Christ. She wrote this book and she made this statement. She said, hold everything in your hands lightly. Otherwise it hurts when God pries your fingers open. Hold everything in your hands lightly, loosely. Otherwise it hurts when God pries your fingers open. Are you willing to live a life of worship where you are willing to sit down across the kitchen table from God and say, here's my yes. Here's my yes. Whatever it is, Lord, it's yours. Job said this. Job, as he was losing everything, in Job chapter 1, verse 21, he said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. He said, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We know that God is good, that God can be trusted. We don't like to think of people like what Job has went through. What people like Job have went through. But are we really, really willing to live that? To live as a disciple of Jesus Christ and say, God, everything that I have is yours. Everything that I have. There was a rich man, multi-millionaire, Saved all of his money up to his death and died on his deathbed. He told his wife, he said, I want you to bury every bit of my money with me. They went and had the funeral. The wife went over there and put something in the casket. He walked away. Weeks later, friends started noticing she had diamond rings. She was driving a new car, all that stuff. And they said, Hey, we thought he told you to put all that money. In the casket, she said, I wrote him a check. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us have been writing a check to God that we don't expect in the cash. We come and say it in our lip service. We come and say it and say, hey, we're going to be a part of the church, and this is part of what, who we are, and this is part of what we do. We really don't expect God to come. Call us something greater. Some of us have said yes to Jesus, but didn't know what it meant. We've made childhood professions of faith, not really understanding that God was going to ask something of us. And some of us have just been saying yes to a false gospel and to a false Jesus unbiblical view of God and worship. How about it? Can you put your guests on the table this morning? Can you sign a blank check and hold it over to God and say, God, I'm yours. About a couple years ago, many of you guys know I left another denomination and was really just trying to seek out God's will and find out next steps and <coughs> What I was doing is I was giving up a really good salary and a really good job. I really didn't have to do that much. Once I got things set up, man, I had people in place and did all that. I, I, had, a, I had a baby, really. And God <coughs> called me to give it up. A matter of principle and a matter of changing my heart on some things. And, um, and so I was looking and, and trying to figure out, you know, 
where am I going to go, where's my family and stuff. And so um, my brother-in-law is a surgeon in Homer, Alaska. And we love Alaska. It's nice if you've ever been. Really nice. Uh, beautiful. And so there was a school there, Alaska Bible Institute. They were hiring a professor of Bible. I said, I believe I'd like to do that. So I went up and met with them, saw the house that they were provided. They really liked me. They really liked Leah. There was just some check in my spirit. And I, as I'm out there in the Alaska landscape looking out there, God said, are you willing to trust me with everything? And not just what you want to put together. <laughs> and so I developed a prayer, three words. There, this beautiful Alaska landscape, and I was sitting there praying. And it's simply these three words. Anything, anytime, anywhere. Anything, anytime, anywhere. And it wasn't long after that that some things led to and led back to me serving in pastoral ministry. I'm yours and all I have is yours. It's not easy. It's still not easy to pray that prayer sometimes, I'll be honest. But that's what I want to strive for. We as Christians should be in the place where we're saying, God, anything, anywhere, anytime, let's do it. My problem, and many of you probably struggle with this too, is we've got a sign up for God that says, make yourself at home. Come in the living room, come in the kitchen, don't go in that room. Whatever you do, God, don't go in there. With this being said and everything, I want us to look back at the word, uh, the, the song that we sang at the first of service, The Heart of Worship. We're going to put that up on the screen. But I'm going to tell you the story behind that. I know that there has been some unsettledness at Mount Zion. <coughs> Let me encourage you, you're not alone. Some unsettledness over worship music, over styles of worship that I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer when it comes to styles of music. I don't have an answer for, I mean, I've got some maybe some direction. We've got to walk with the Holy Spirit in those things. I love Him. I love the contemporary stuff. I love mixing it. I love, you know, I don't know. We'll just say, hey, let's all see God as a church to get there. But before we can even answer those questions, can we get back to this? The heart of true biblical worship. The heart of true biblical worship. How this song was written, Matt Redman, who is from England, his church was experiencing a lot of the same stuff, I think, in the late 90s. You know, bands were getting popular, some people liked it, some people didn't, you know, all that stuff. And, and church just became about the music. And that was the most important part of the worship. We have to understand that worship is a lifestyle. So the pastor of Matt's church come together with the church and said, we're not going to have music for a season. We're still going to sing, but we're going to sing a cappella, but we're not going to make this about the music. We're going to make this about what the true worship is. And I don't feel God leading us in a direction like that, and I think it's a really neat story, but I think that pastor was really walking with God in that. But that's when Matt was sitting around and writing some songs when he wrote this song. And, and based on what we just studied today, I want, I want to see if you guys, you, you don't have to stand, you can stand if you want to, but it's completely up to you. But I wanted to see if we could, in light of the words that we studied this morning, could we as a church revisit this song? Is that okay? You got somewhere to go? When the music 
go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father God, King of the universe, we come to you with concerns, but we also like to bring you thanks for all the blessings that you have put in our lives, Lord. Please, Father, you, you've listened to all the concerns that have come up to us, Father, uh, whether it be people who are, are battling cancer, or Lord, or those that have come through surgery, or those that are just battling different illnesses, Father. You know every need and concern in our hearts, Lord. We ask you to please, 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 Father, provide comfort for these people, provide healing as you see fit, Father, and also just let them feel your presence and flood them with your Holy Spirit, that they feel you in every aspect of their life. They see you in every aspect of their life and know that they are not alone, Lord. We ask you to continue to be with our church, Lord, and help us to focus our attention towards you and solely you and to worship you, Lord, and how you would see us do. Let us also become that light in the dark world around us so that we can, we can be that beacon, Lord, for the community around us and the world around us to shine your light and glorify you in all that we do. Lord, I just thank you so much for, for Mount Zion. I thank you for your son Jesus dying on the cross for us and being washed holy in his blood, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We can skip it today. Y'all know it. All right? You didn't change your beliefs today, I'm pretty sure. All right. Go to study school. Let's go.